as we move to net zero goals, we really need to be focused on energy. And in that case, what I'm hoping is as you walk away from this presentation that you think about nuclear, not just as nuclear power, but as nuclear energy and what, what the possibilities are. Um, in this slide, you'll see on the top bar there, we are about 37% low carbon in our electricity generation. We are significantly lower progressing in terms of decarbonizing our total energy, which is electricity, transportation, and heat. Doesn't mean that we don't know what we intend to do in those spaces, um, but we have a longer road. If we look at, um, there we go. If we look at what that relates to in terms of carbon emissions, you can see the top blue line here um, with electric power. Um, you know, we started to make significant progress in reducing the carbon emissions for electric power. Um, transportation recently has started to make some improvements in, in their carbon emissions, but we've been the next, the third, I guess, kind of pink line there. Um, pink, we'll go with pink. Um, the pink line there for the industrial sector has remained relatively the same. This particular sector, and I think um, Melissa is gonna touch on it as well. This is probably, given the diversity of this sector alone is going to be um, some of the more challenging areas where we work to decarbonize. And I think there is an opportunity here um, specific for nuclear. Um, but not to be dismissive of electricity, to look exactly at what has been happening in the trends associated with electricity, you can see on the far right, uh, well, on the left graph, left-hand side graph, on the far right, you can see wind and solar obviously have uh, come up. I think that's a story we all know about. Our, our coal plants have been retiring. We've seen a decrease in coal, but that's been primarily replaced by gas. On the right-hand side, you see the result of the same work in terms of CO2 emissions for the United States. So overall, we have less emissions. That's the blue line, the, blue line, the top blue line. Um, but you also see that we've had increases in emissions from the use of natural gas. This is the balance that, that we're all gonna be working with over the next few decades. What does this mix actually end up looking like? Um, spoiler alert, it's going to be different for each of us in different regions. And that's based on the resources you have available to you and the industries that you need to support. So that's what makes it a bit challenging. Um, you know, we can set as many federal goals as we might like, but where this is really going to get figured out is at a state and a regional and a community level. What might influence that the most? Um, I'm sure many of you have looked at uh, different scenarios and how to reach um, net zero. Um, and I think there's, I, I think there's challenges associated with all of all of those different pathways to net zero. We will see a significant change in our fuel sources. But what I wanted to point out with this slide, this is a study that was recently completed by Decarb America, um, which is a research initiative um, bringing three NGOs together. Every fuel source is going to have its challenges associated with deployment. And that will impact how much of that resource we are actually able to deploy. Citing considerations for transmission, sociopolitical acceptance are some of the common things that you see for all of these different fuel sources. So diversity will be um, what what helps us the most. And as we look forward at policies, I think that's where it's important to make sure that we're 
technology inclusive and keeping all the tools in the toolbox as we proceed down the decarbonization path. Um, to start to get your arms around the amount, the infrastructure implications associated with this transition, on the right hand side, you see um, uh, again from Decarb America, they basically used in their models, uh, they allowed innovation to happen. They allowed the, uh, the technology to progress to a cost effective deployable technology in their model. And given that, then they looked at what the infrastructure build out might look like. So you can see the details here, but the, the items that I've highlighted on the left-hand side there, this is double the amount of wind. This is double the amount of solar. Um, deploying 10 to 30 times the amount of zero emission vehicles. Um, all of these things, and oh, by the way, begin construction on pop pipelines. When I see this information, it always makes me come back to, we need to preserve the infrastructure where we can. And we need to creatively think about how we deploy and use that infrastructure for a decarbonized future. To give you an idea um, around kind of, whoops, that went ahead. There we go. Um, this is just looking at the build out of wind and solar and where we've been. Um, so let me, this is a bit complicated. The bars represent the different scenarios that were, uh, that the Decarb America initiative looked at. But looking from what it would, each one of them would build out relative to wind and solar for the next decade, all of them are requiring a significant amount of build out of utility scale solar and onshore wind. The gray bar in the background across all of that, that's how much we've been building out historically. So if we want to match pace with what these models are telling us, we have to be building at a rate 50% higher than any previous historical year. Let's look at the existing nuclear fleet. Um, I'm gonna read this chart going left to right. Um, so one, one little box, no matter the color, is one unit. One unit is typically a, a thousand megawatt plant. In 2013, we had 105 units operating. We, I don't think I'm telling you guys anything new that due to economic pressures, we have seen our nuclear plants be prematurely retired over the last few years. That's the head-to-head -head competition with natural gas. Um, so we've had 12 units that have prematurely closed. We currently still have four units with announced plans to close. In the fourth column where you start to see the green, that is the state level actions that have happened specifically to address um, the economic pressures for the plants. So there's been state level policies, whether that's zero emission credits, um, uh, those, those types of policies is what I'm mentioning there. So that's saved 19 units in particular. And then you start to look at the, um, the fifth column, so our nuclear plants are licensed normally for the initial licenses for 40 years. Many, and those are the orange ones at the very bottom, we have um, eight units that have a 40 year license. The vast majority of our fleet today has a 60 year license. So they extended that initial license for another 20 years. The top ones in dark green, are 19 units that are pursuing and or have received extension to 80 years. So if we were to look at that and say, take that as gospel that the other 19, that all of those 19 are gonna to go to 80 years. By 2050, 
we would only have 24 units operating of our current fleet. And you can see if you look at that last column and you read that down, so to speak, you, the different colors indicate how many units would be retiring every five years. However, there's an opportunity here. There's nothing that technically limits us at this time. It has been studied um, from preventing us from extending to 80 years. What does that give us? And this is just looking, so now we're looking at the number of plants operating. Sorry to switch it on you, but <laughs> the number of op plants operating instead of the retiring. Um, and in this case, what you see is if we extend 90% of those plants with a 60 year license, we would have 74 plants continuing to operate into 2050, giving us that clean firm power um, and helping us with the, the transitions along the way. This does not address uh, adding any capacity with new nuclear. I'm gonna pause for just a second and have a little water here. Okay. Coming back to what your energy mix might look like again in the 2050 timeframe, if you were to roll it up and look at it from a US perspective, you might see this kind of figure. Again, these columns represent different scenarios and there's a lot of details behind those different scenarios. <clears throat> what I wanna highlight is the variety. Um, you can see in a high conservation scenario, there's an aggressive use of efficiency improvements. <coughs> Sorry, just one second. And that does reduce our primary energy consumption. <coughs> However, if you look at it at a state level, it can look very, very different. And in some states, not having a lot of variety at all. Nuclear may not be the right answer for your state. And that's not what I'm here to say. But I am here to say that nuclear may be part of the overall solution for clean firm power, whether it's in your state or in your region. <coughs> this is really terrible that I have this cough that has shown up halfway through. Give me one second. I'm going to take a really big swig of water and see what happens. It's always the way it goes, Christine. It happens to me exactly the same at the exact moment. Ah, oh, thanks for the... <laughs> it does. It does. I know. I can be going all day on Zoom doing great. Um, this is why scenario planning is so important. And this is a muscle that I think we're all going to have to have and get used to. We're used to building a plan and executing on those plans. It's hard to tell exactly what's gonna happen over the next several decades. So today, I think thinking about how you can have access to um, people that can help you with scenario planning, getting used to coming back and revisiting it and looking at it, looking at it in a regional way, maybe not necessarily look at your neighbors as to what's going on. Um, and again, keep as many tools in the toolbox as you can. We just, you just don't know how this will play out. Okay, now here's your nuclear commercial. Um, so I talked about the existing fleet. Um, so what's going on with advanced fission? So multiple flag, factors can play into any deployment decision you might make. If you were to just go talk to any nuclear person, the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna want to talk to you about the kind of reactor they have and what it can do, because that's how we think about it. But I, in, in, 
And that's because we're nerds too. You just have to admit that. Um, but <laughs> so what you really need to do though is, is start to think about what size, what space you have for a reactor. And this is different from what we have today. These reactors are being built in, as you can see here, all the way from micro to small to medium-sized reactors to the large size we have today. The primary difference though is we won't need as much space for emergency planning zones that we've had in the past. Emergency planning zones will likely be at our site boundary. So we'll have a smaller footprint in community. These reactors are also well suited for producing um, electricity as well as heat. So that heat, that high temperature process heat can be something very useful either in doing things like producing hydrogen if that becomes an important part of your clean energy future for your region or you could use it to power, cleanly power um, some industrial processes. So some designs also offer, offer the opportunity to consume the existing spent fuel from the existing fleet. All of them are being designed with flexibility in mind to be good partners to wind and solar. Um, we will, these are moving towards factory fabrication to support um, cost effective and quick deployment. Um, down at the bottom here, just for reference, um, I always find this helpful is, you know, thinking about how much, so a small town needs one megawatt, a mid-sized city needs one gigawatt, the whole U.S. uses a thousand gigawatts. So this is what um, the Office of Nuclear Energy most recently kicked off. This is a, an incredibly large set of projects. There's 10 projects under the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. Um, some of these projects, the two projects lift, listed on the left-hand side in Wyoming and Colorado are large demonstration projects and it's a 50-50 cost share with, um, with private industry. These units are expected to be operational in seven years. The mid, the mid group here, the, the risk reduction projects, these are projects that are really focusing, whether it's on technical risk or regulatory risks, that will enable them to be demonstrable in 10 to 12 years. And then you have on the far right-hand side under concept development, um, projects that are longer term, um, and looking at deploying 15, you know, demonstrating 15 to 20 years from now. So there's a lot of different concepts under development. And if you were to look at where these companies are and where these projects are, this gives you an idea of how, what it looks like across the whole United States. And in addition, you can see that this is the decade of demonstration for advanced nuclear. We have, as I said, we have some things that are going on for first of a kind commercial facilities. We also have um, some items going on that are helpful to setting up the supply chain that we'll need associated with advanced nuclear. So this is how the public dollar is starting um, to meet the moment around um, what we can do with nuclear energy associated with meeting um, net zero goals. Um, to share with you, um, uh, looking at it from a state perspective, Energy Northwest worked with E3 to do this study. The link on the bottom of the page gets you to um, a PowerPoint presentation as well as a a detailed document about this study. But what they did is if you look from left to right here, this was to look at um, what it would take to meet their, what capacity they would need if they met their goals only with 100% renewable. That's the first column there. The second column is just keeping 
Columbia, extending the license of Columbia Generating Station, which is 1.2 gigawatts. So you see the installed capacity gets a little lower. If you add six and a half gigawatts of nuclear, and I think that was mocked up using small modular reactors, that's when you see the biggest impact in terms of the amount of build out. So I think that has to factor into our thinking as we think about meeting net zero goals is also how much do we have to build and how do we optimize across this? I, I think it's important, just like you would with a retirement portfolio, I, diversity is important for you know, security and reliability as well as we look forward. Um, I'm more than happy to point you to other studies that might be available as well. Um, this is a very busy chart and I apologize for that. Um, I haven't figured out a good way to, um, I haven't figured out a good way to uh, make this simpler. This is again, um, a recent analysis looking at the importance of innovation. So each set of columns is allowing um, innovation in that particular sector, whether it's carbon sequestration, nuclear, renewables. That fourth column is universal, um, universal innovation across the board. And their reference case is the far right-hand set of columns. What they're saying there is for us to, to meet a, a, a net zero by 2050 future, that's going to win a high renewables, high electrification strategy. That would cost $405 billion. If you look at the universal case, which is at the bottom, the net cost for executing that is 188 billion when you allow for diversity and innovation across all clean energy. This means we will have natural gas with carbon capture. We will have um, lower cost deployment of nuclear and the renewable um, infrastructure as well. Um, that is the best place for me to leave it for Melissa, I will point out there's um, a couple additional uh, tools we have. So if you're curious about advanced nuclear, we have a website um, where you can kind of browse at your interest about milestones. Then we have an energy calculator, but I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa if I can find the stop share button. Ready to go. Thanks, Christine. And Jessica, if I could just confirm, we got about 15 minutes for you to speak. Is that still work or? Um, sure, about, yeah, 15. And then we'll leave a few few minutes for questions. I can tailor to whatever is best. So you just let me know um, and we'll go from there. So hopefully you can see slides. Is that yep. Easy? Yep, great. Right, so the title of, of on this slide says getting to 100% zero carbon power. But as Christine just highlighted, you know what I'll be talking about in this is not just kind of guideposts to keep in mind as you're developing policies and regulations and initiatives getting to 100% zero carbon power, but honestly, most places along the road to that. So whether it's an 80% goal, a high renewables goal, just thinking about how do we make sure to keep electricity, which is the backbone of so much in our economy and seems poised to be the backbone of even more of our economy, reliable and affordable. So um, my name is Dr. Melissa Lott, for those of in the room who don't know me and the Center on Global Energy Policy. At the Center on Global Energy Policy, which is part of Columbia University's School of Public and International Affairs, we were started just about eight and a half years ago with this idea of many decision makers, not a number of us came out of policy making spheres, including our director, Jason Bordoff, who was in the White House at the time. And he found himself in a place where he was having to make decisions with information from different groups with, you know, skin in the game, with interest in the game. And he was saying, how do I make an informed decision and understand how to sort through, you know, these two papers in front of me that actually are saying very different things? How do I find an independent, unbiased, you know, evidence-driven organization that can help me to make a more informed choice. So to get the information I need on a time frame and in a format that is usable to me in this decision-making process. 
And so eight years later, we are a team of about 60 people, including about just under 40 researchers of different levels uh, across a whole host of initiatives. So I'm the director of research at the center, and I'm also the co-lead of our uh, power sector research initiative, along with Dr. Harrison Fell, who recently joined us also from NC State, actually, uh, Christine. So small world. So the question is, as we move towards whether it's 100%, 80%, 50%, zero carbon power, more than we have today, what do we need to do to build the team of technologies that we need in the future again to have this affordable and reliable power system? So in terms of where we are today, the power sector across the country, and um, this is just a national number just to ground us all in this, and it looks, of course, significantly different in different states, but really we're looking at the green line up at the top. And so we have, as Christine said, seen emissions come down for a variety of reasons, including cheap renewables, also cheap gas, replacing coal and pushing you know, higher carbon resources out of the mix. But we still are projecting a significant gap if your uh, goal is, let's say, zero carbon by mid-century. Um, and an even larger gift, a gap if you're looking at some kind of 2035 or other target. So this is just giving us an idea of the degree of the challenge that we're, we're facing. And when we look at across again the United States, where we are today, where we have something like just under 40% zero carbon resources, that big purple bar being nuclear, we're on track to maybe get just south of 50% across again the entire country. And when we look at sustainable development scenarios from the International Energy Agency or a study that came out of UC Berkeley, um, I think it was just about a year, year and a half ago at this point, or the study that came out of Princeton and Jesse Jenkinson's group there, the Net Zero study, how do we get from what would be around 50%, so again, more than today, but not even we're close to 100 to 100%, and what kind of technologies do we need in that? Across all these different scenarios, you see a bunch of themes, and that's what I'm going to explain, because it's easy to get into scenarios, and I'm a, I'm a modeler. I love running the scenarios. I'm a nerd like Christine. I love doing the numbers. But the important thing is, what can I take away from all these scenarios and say, these are the themes that are cross-cutting across tons of different assumptions, tons of different data about future costs and, and future demand, what actually comes through across the board in these studies? And what we find is that in the future, we need a significant percentage of firm dispatchable power plants. So those power plants that are there 24-7, 365, when we need them, they can come on. One thing I'll highlight is that we don't just need 38% of like the current firm dispatchable power plants. When we need these plants, we actually need a lot of them because the wind and the sun go away. And so we need, you know, a plant over the course of a year, or maybe it only operates at, you know, a small percentage of the time, but on the days we need it, it's running full bore hundred percent. And this is really important for how we develop out things to keep the lights on. And so when I talk about dealing with the gap, what I'm really talking about is what is the mix of technologies that avoids us having gaps between demand and supply? otherwise known as blackouts, otherwise known as not having electricity when we need it. That's the gap I'm talking about. Um, for those who've been to London, I'm not talking about the tube, I'm talking about the lights going out and standing here in Texas today um, and having been here in February, you know, this is a very real and direct uh, type of concern when it comes to my life and I'm sure many of us are lives. So when you wanna to go to net zero electricity, so this is the far out, we're going to 100% part of all those scenarios. What we see is that across an economy, to Christine's point, we use a lot more electricity. We don't just use electricity for things we use it to today, we use it increasingly for our cars, and of course there've been recent announcements about regional initiatives to build out electric vehicle infrastructure and, and groups of states actually working towards that. But also we use it in industry, we use it increasingly in our buildings. We're just using a lot more electricity. So uh, we are trying to be more efficient, we're trying to conserve, we're trying to do a lot of things, but actually when it comes to power, we use a lot more of it in all the scenarios. And an interesting tidbit that I'm happy to explain with anyone in the future if you wanna dig into the numbers on this is, if we actually electrify fewer things, so fewer heaters, fewer cars, what we see in the scenarios is that we actually need more electricity being produced because we use it to produce fuels to go into our cars. So we use it to produce hydrogen, biomethane, et cetera. So across all the scenarios, we're using a heck of a lot more electricity. And that electricity supply becomes zero carbon very quickly, whether it's you know the first line on that graph earlier or the next line or something in between, or even a much flatter and it goes out with a longer tail. 
we're using a lot more zero carbon stuff very quickly. And if we want to keep our systems affordable and reliable, we see these scenarios across the board, including three buckets of technology. So it's like a three-legged stool. Leg number one is zero marginal cost variable power plants, your wind and your solar. When they're around, they're cheap. The cost declines have been incredibly impressive, but they're not there all the time. We all know this just in our practical lives. We know the sunsets. I mean, how many times can someone tell you this? But what we also see is that even if we complement them with what I call bucket three, energy storage technologies, we still see gaps between supply and demand. And filling those gaps just with those two buckets leaves us with a wobbly stool, leaves us with a more expensive and potentially less reliable system, which is why we need that bucket in the middle. So these are the firm dispatchable zero carbon power plants. This is where nuclear comes into play. And if you have existing nuclear or if as a state you're considering or open or you're considering or maybe open to future advanced nuclear projects in your state, this is where those plants can play. Also large hydro, though uh, we have to be careful with climate sensitivities, meaning do we have the water in the reservoir when we need it? And it might also include natural gas with carbon capture utilization and storage, though in that case, just like with other technologies, geothermal, etc., you have to think about do I have pore space? Do I have somewhere under the ground to actually put those gases? Or do I have the ability to build a pipeline to move those gases to where I can store it? Because capturing is enough, we have to store it. We have to store it either in a product or a fuel or in the ground. So on, across all these scenarios, we absolutely see more wind and solar, full stop. We do see a lot more energy storage as well, but we see a lot of this firm dispatchable zero carbon power plants um, playing in the mix if we wanna keep the cost low and the reliability high. So I use an analogy and Timothy was there when I gave a lecture at MIT and um, thought that this might be a good way to think about it for y'all, so I'm gonna step through it. I uh, will admit that I am terrible at playing soccer, but I like watching it, so that's where this was born from. I was a water polo player growing up, so uh, I am a spectator, uh, very, very poor at it. But if we think about how we're gonna build a zero carbon team in the future that we need, what does everything I've just said actually mean in terms of the team? So I think of our variable renewables as strikers. You want them out there. When you have those electrons coming out of your solar panels, use them. They're cheap, they're great, they're there, you wanna use them. You wanna either use them directly in that moment or store them so you can use them an hour later, eight hours later, even with some new technologies, maybe 100 hours later. They, but you wanna add in some midfielders. I think this is actually where energy storage comes into play. So when the wind and sun are not there, you can come in with some midfielders with some energy storage and actually say, we got your back, pass the ball to me, I got you for a few hours. But you know what? Eventually our midfielders will get worn out if everything's on them. And so you need some defenders. Those are those firm dispatchable power plants. And by having all three of these types of players be able to play on your team, um, you end up with a lower cost overall team. And we can go into the dynamics of professional sports, but the bottom line is those kilowatt hours delivered to people are a lot cheaper overall, um, which as you know, all of us who work with constituents and all of us who pay power bills know matters. And with the numbers in the US, about one in three Americans already being energy insecure across the country, you know, either have high energy burden, very high bills compared to income, or don't heat or cool their house to a safe temperature because they know they can't afford it, we certainly don't want those numbers to get worse. We want to narrow them over time. And this is, this is people's lives, this is people's health. And we see these effects across the country all the time, including in the February freeze where we lost power, we saw direct effects. Now, don't forget about the goalie. I will add this in as something that if you are looking at going to 100% zero carbon, you also wanna consider these carbon removal technologies. I have no idea why the S is so small. There are multiple ones, but there we go. It is there, it is a plural. So there's different technologies in this, both that we kind of know how they work, like direct air capture. We know how carbon capture works, but also technologies that might be uh, there in the future. And what happens is sometimes the ball just gets past us. We can't eliminate those emissions, so we want those negative emissions technologies. So this is what I mean by the three buckets with this wild card fourth. We are grateful for our goalie if we want to get to 100% zero carbon. When they work together, you end up with a great team. And part of the reason why we think of these as a team is every single one of these buckets has trade-offs. So we've got zero marginal costs, cheap, amazing when they're there. They're not there all the time. Storage, you know, they're great for like between days. You can get some hours out of it. Maybe with some new technologies, you can get up to 100 hours out of it. But it's not good for those periods of time in many of our states where we actually see wind and solar 
not around at the same time to a point where you need to be bridging week-long gaps or even seasonal gaps where you see some of your resources you know fading back so your strikers get tired your midfielders can't really fill in so you want those defenders and then that goalie to make everything work timothy hopefully i did you proud on that one um so what i'll say is when you talk about losing a member of the team here's what we see we see a cost impact um and we see a reliability and resilience impact so I'll take the February freeze in Texas as an example, just because it's more fresh on our minds. In that freeze, we saw lots of different things go wrong. So we saw actually a nuclear power plant tripping offline. It came back on very fast. It was a pump issue. Um, we also saw natural gas plants who couldn't get fuel and some who froze. We saw wind turbine blades freezing. We saw there was just a lot going on. So the bottom line is you want to hedge against risk by having all these different members of the team. So your striker gets a cramp and it needs to go back to your midfielder they're there for you and overall we see that including at least one firm low carbon generation technology in the mix lowers costs substantially um, and also hedges against these risks from a reliability standpoint and overall in terms of how much firm power do we actually need we're looking at you know about the same as we have today like that's the reality of what we're looking at and again it goes back to the point of when we take this overall mix, if we have less than that, we see costs increase. So it's not like I need a token firm dispatchable power plant somewhere in my system and I'll be fine. No, we probably need about the same that we have today. And when it comes to nuclear across these scenarios, there's a lot of variations. And this is something we can talk about in the policy discussions, Jessica, and in the, in the breakout rooms. But it's a question of, do you have existing nuclear? How old is it? How long are you thinking about having it around? Are you looking at these lifetime extensions or not? And are you considering next generation technologies? Is that something that in your particular case, it may make sense based on the resources that you have? So in terms of different recommendations, I'll say that we've written a whole host of stuff about what this means for policymakers. But at a very high level, it means that when you're designing targets in your state, there is a a risk of saying, oh, I'm going to go for a renewable energy target. And believe you me, if I could tell you that the lowest transition pathway was 100% renewables with a battery on it, well, great, we have those technologies today. Easy, get it done. But we see risk in that. So what we say is that when we look at policies, policies that support 100% zero carbon power may end up having your state be 100% renewable, but it may not. And it leaves space for these other technologies to play in keeping the overall cost of your system down. And this is just borne out across all the scenarios that we look at. So with that, I'll just um, say thank you very much.